an altar to the Lord. We find this expression, an altar to the Lord, in Isaiah 19, 19, and 20, where we read, In that day shall there be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt, and a pillar at the border thereof to the Lord. And we're going to look at it in terms of current engineering as of, you know, the 21st century. So there are things that we're going to see that weren't evident in his day. And we're going to look at it in in, uh, many different aspects as we go through this. Great pyramid, an ancient writer said, it seemed like a building let down from heaven, untouched by human hands. And this is an artist's rendering of what, they believed it looked like. So it was smooth white limestone. We know based on other accounts that it could be seen for many, many miles. So it was like a beacon that stood out because it was on a high plateau overlooking uh, the delta of Egypt and then the Mediterranean as well. So we're going to answer three questions. First question, does Isaiah 19, 19, and 20 refer to the Great Pyramid? Question number two. Who designed it? Notice that I didn't say who built it. That's the question everybody asks uh, in in all the pyramid uh, programs and documentaries. They want to know who built it. We're going to look at who designed it because that's what's important. And then what is its purpose? So for the next uh, 45 minutes or so, this will be the focus of our attention to answer these three questions. In Isaiah 19... 19 through 20, we read, In that day shall there be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt, and a pillar at the border thereof to the Lord, and it shall be for a sign and for a witness unto the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt. So this really gives us a description. So is that the Great Pyramid? Well, let's look at a little more detail at what these phrases mean. Whenever we hear Egypt, we can think symbolically that really represents the world. The, an altar is a place for sacrifice. So whenever we saw an altar, and usually there were stone altars, it was a place for sacrifice, and really that was a meeting place between God and man. A pillar means a memorial stone, and we realize there are many memorial stones in Egypt, so uh, this is yet another one. And it will be for a sign, a monument, or a metaphor to God. And finally, it will be a witness. And what does a witness do? A witness tells a story. So we see the aspects that are defined here, where it's going to be. It's going to be a witness for Egypt, the world. And it will be a meeting place between God and man, a pillar, and a monument unto the Lord. And it will tell a story. Let's see if this applies to the Great Pyramid. And we know, based on in that day, that at the end time it would speak. So let's hear what it's saying. We start by looking at this expression, there shall be an altar in the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt and a pillar at the border thereof. Now, this language, to start with, seems a little veiled because how can it be in the midst or middle of Egypt and also be on the border of Egypt? And we would have to go back to geography from this period to have an understanding of that. And so what we see was in Egypt there was a lower kingdom. That was the uh, the delta region. And there was an upper region, which was the, the head of the Nile on down to the delta. And so that's how it can qualify. It was the border between these two kingdoms. And yet it was in the midst of Egypt as well. And one of the things that we note as we look at this, it's kind of intriguing. We look at the shape of the delta, and it's almost a perfect quarter pie shaped. And if you were to look at this from outer space, you almost have like a big arrow pointing right at something there. And it is the Great Pyramid at Giza. It's also very interesting. It's the center of the world's landmass. It says it's going to be in the midst of the land of the entire land of Egypt, the entire world. And does it meet that qualification? Well, if we draw a latitude meridian there, on that meridian is the most land of any meridian in the entire earth. So you see from north to south, that is the longest block of contiguous land. 
on the other side is the shortest amount of land because it goes through the Bering Strait. Kind of interesting. So it divides the Earth into four equal land masses. This is intriguing because nobody had that knowledge on Earth. It was a, nobody had this perspective of this map that we're looking at today, and yet look at it. It equally divides the Earth into four quadrants. So no human being had that knowledge at that time. In fact, from a cartography standpoint, it was probably the 20th century before we really uh, uh, came to understand this. And we look at the seven wonders of the world. Remember, it says it's going to stand basically for eternity, and we had seven wonders of the world, these great wonders of the world. And we look at what happened to all of them. And they basically went away, except for one that's still standing today, the Great Pyramid. Now, does the scripture itself, Isaiah 19, 19, and 20, actually point to the Great Pyramid? And we would say yes. And there's a way we can determine that if we go back to the Hebrew. In the Hebrew, every letter has a numeric equivalent. And if you line up all the words and then add up all the numbers, you come up with 59, 49. And we find that from the or the grotto in the pyramid, we'll show you what that is, to the base of the capstone is 5,449 pyramid inches. Kind of intriguing, isn't it? That measurement is represented, and it's saying, guess what? This is what I'm referring to. When you see this kind of thing, it, it excites me. And so what does Isaiah 19, 19, and 20 refer to? We think it does definitively refer to the Great Pyramid. And so now we're going to look at the question of who designed it. How can you prove beyond a reasonable doubt who designed it? We're going to look at a number of proofs. When we look at the uh, pyramids of Giza, there are three pyramids there. The little one, the Pyramid of Menkere, uh, the Pyramid of Caffrey in the middle, which everyone mistakes to be the tallest pyramid, but in fact it's higher on the plateau. It is a shorter pyramid than the Great Pyramid. And then the Great Pyramid of Khufu. And it is the, the largest, tallest, and oldest pyramid on the Giza Plateau. Now, one question that always comes up with archaeologists is, was this a burial tomb? And so we're going to look at a number of questions that I think give us a pretty definitive answer. The first thing is, in this pyramid, prominently figured was red granite. There are no other pyramids where there's red granite. What was red granite used in, in uh, Egypt? It was used for temples. And so this temple that was on the Nile had red granite in it. And yet we know that in the Great Pyramid there was red granite in it. No mummy was ever found. You know, they always, they always say, well, the mummy was in the sarcophagus, and somehow when Al Mamun got in there, it wasn't there, there wasn't any treasure. There's no mummy. There are air passages not found in any other pyramid, period. No other pyramid has that feature. There was no treasures ever found in there. No hieroglyphs. There are some builder's marks above the, uh, the king's chamber, but there are no hieroglyphs in the uh, relief that they are in all the other pyramids. And remember, that was an important part of telling the story of whoever was buried there. Um, so very important, but there's no hieroglyphs in this pyramid. It was built by free men. And this is something that they've really only determined in the last 10 or 15 years, is they know that free men built it because now they are excavating their burial tombs and their graves, and they found out that many of them had injuries, and then they were healed. And so they find men with broken bones that knit, and they can tell uh, based on the, uh, the bodies that there was a period of time where they were healed, and when, if it was just slave labor, they tended to... Uh, to discard them when they got broken. It's the only pyramid with ascending passages, and it's the only pyramid with uh, chambers above ground. So clearly this is a significantly different pyramid, so it doesn't follow the prescription for any burial tomb in uh, Egypt. And so we say, no, this was not a burial tomb, so what was it? One of the important things to understanding who designed it, and remember that's the question we're trying to answer, is how do we discern God? If I ask you for one book in the Bible where God gives us some clues as to how to discern him, what would it be? 
Well, I'll suggest to you it would be what God told Job. And we, when we turn to uh, Job chapter 38, we get questions from God. He poses these to Job. He says, where were you when I laid the earth's foundations? He says, who marked the earth's dimensions? God says, who stretched a measuring line across the earth? He said, on what were the earth's foundations set? Who laid the earth's cornerstone? What is the way to the abode of light and darkness? Can you bind the beautiful Pleiades? Can you loose the cords of Orion? Can you bring the constellations in their seasons? Can you lead the bear with its cubs? Do you know the laws of the heavens? Who endowed the heart with wisdom? Who gave understanding to the mind? And when we think about it, these things are giving us clues about God. He's asking, can any of you explain any of this? And the answer was no, they couldn't. God had this knowledge. And so by its very nature, it can help us understand whether this pyramid demonstrates these things. Time, geography, mathematics, geology, engineering, God's plan, cosmology, physics, ransom, and intelligence. So if we can find these characteristics demonstrated in the pyramid, then that's evidence of to who the, uh, the designer of the Great Pyramid was. So our question that we're going to look at for most of the rest of our time is, does the pyramid show these characteristics? Are you interested or intrigued? I am. When we look at the uh, pyramid, the pyramid shape is the only one that has a chief cornerstone. It is the Great Pyramid is the largest stone building on Earth, even today by volume. So there are larger buildings, but there are no buildings that have more cubic uh, feet of stone in them. In fact, they said if you took all of the stones from the pyramid, you could make a six-foot-wide uh, sidewalk that went around the equator of the Earth. That's how much uh, stone is in there, so a lot. And we're told, and if you're an engineer, you're a structural engineer or building engineer, you're probably going to debate this, but we're told that it would be uh, the precision in it is even unrivaled in today's world. So the 13 or 14 acres that this takes up, their accuracy is absolutely incredibly precise. And what I was told, according to some sources, is that we're not capable of building a building of this size with this precision today. Now, a lot of that would have to do with the scope of, of this kind of a project, but the accuracy is, is a problem even with all of our laser levels and the things that we have today. We're going to look at the pyramid passages, so we're going to actually go for a little tour of the pyramid. You're going to crawl through. We hope to give you a uh, pictorial view of the pyramid. Some of the uh, pictures we're going to use are antique pictures, and the reason we do that is some of the structures now have railings and all sorts of stuff, and so we're going to show you the way it was at the time the uh, Mortons were there early on. And so we start with the entrances. The main entrance was actually up from where Al Mamun uh, entered. Remember, Al Mamun was the one that wanted to get into the pyramid and find the great treasure, because this was the largest pyramid in that entire plateau, and he knew there must be great wealth there. And so he used a combination of fire and vinegar to crack through the limestone and tunnel through. He couldn't find the entrance. Remember, this is when the, when the uh, casing stones were still there. And so it was so smooth, and they said once the door closed, you couldn't even detect where it was. Okay, And the, the claim was that you couldn't put a piece of paper in there. But it would swivel. One man could push it open from the inside. So that's where the main entrance was. Al Mamun had to uh, kind of uh, blast his way in using uh, rudimentary tools. And so we start with the descending passage. As we get about uh, part of the way down, you'll see a granite plug, and we'll talk about that, and then the ascending passage. So if we go in the descending passage and look back towards the entrance, you're bent over, you're looking back towards the entrance. Now if you turn around, what you would see is the descending passage continuing on down as far as you can see, and then you see overhead the base of the granite plug. 
initially this was the only passage they found. They they would bang on the ceiling and they noticed a difference in sound, and that's how they broke out and discovered the granite plug. So the granite plug is right there. If you go around, uh, they actually tunneled around to get above the granite plug because it's actually three plugs in a row. And this is the top plug here. And then you see the base of the ascending passage going up and to the right. Now we're in the ascending passage looking down at the, the uh, last granite plug. The stairway we've gone up is just to the left. If we turn around, what we see is the ascending passage, still low, you have to bend over. And you see one of the uh, girdle stones uh, right here. There are three girdle stones in that passage as you go up. And, of course, they've added nice rails and treads so that people don't get hurt going up here. If we were to continue down, go back to the descending passage, there are uh, a number of features. One is the well, which we'll look at, the subterranean chamber, and the pit. And this is one of the areas where we're going to show you an antique picture. This is the subterranean passage before there was uh, railings and markings and all sorts of other stuff that went on. Uh, there were some uh, ancient writings on the wall in this section, kind of graffiti. Uh, and this is the subterranean chamber. And what you notice here is you wouldn't be claustrophobic here because it's a pretty big chamber. And if we look down, this is another antique picture of the pit. And so we see the pit, and it had been largely filled in by debris that washed down the descending passage. Now, if we go back out and we start to go up the descending passage a ways, we come to the bottom of the well. And the significance of this is, first of all, realize in Alma Moon's day that this was not open. This was four feet of limestone here, between here and the well. And one of the evidences of that, there was some Roman writing from Roman times found in the subterranean chamber, but it wasn't found anywhere else in the pyramid. And undoubtedly, if they had been roaming around other parts through uh, something like the bottom of the well, uh, they would have marked up things as well, but they didn't. So this was actually chipped out through four feet of natural limestone. So this is underground. And if you were turned to the left today, what you would see is the bottom of the well. And that well was actually chiseled out top to bottom. And then it ended. It didn't connect. So this was unknown before Al Mamun. And the only way he found it was he bypassed the, uh, the plugs, got into the ascending chamber, and then he noticed that because of some destruction, which you'll see in a minute, he saw the top of the well. And so, of course, they investigated. And this is looking up the well. It's a rough cut passages. It was dug from the top down. And it links to the, the underground to the passages above. Important to note. It's a very steep tunnel. In fact, the last courses from the grotto on up are vertical, and they are uh, made of masonry from there on up. But this is through rock. And this is a picture of the grotto. And so to right behind the man, there is a natural grotto or cave that occurred. And then you see the, uh, the stones that lead on the vertical part of the well leading up to the, uh, to the intersection of the ascending passage, the grand gallery, and the, uh, the other passage. And so here we are looking up the well. We have the ascending passage and the horizontal passage and the grand gallery. And at the intersection is what? The well. Here's a, a drawing, an artist's drawing of the well. This is after they cleared out the debris when Al Mahmoud was there, and then from then on. And what they said was it looked as though there was an explosion and it just blew out. This was all limestone here that covered this well opening, but at some point it blew out. And, uh, and so they, that's how they discovered the well. So they, of course, cleared that debris. So looking down, we've gone a little bit up the Grand Gallery. We're looking back. The top of the well you just saw would be where the arrow points. The ascending passage we just came up. And the horizontal passage actually goes right underneath us. This is a, another antique picture where we see, uh, I think this is one of the Morton brothers going up the Grand Gallery. And he's having to use handholds. There are no rails at that point. And so we see the difference there as well. And so he has to pull up by his hands. Now, the Grand Gallery is, is very impressive. It is seven times taller than the Ascending Passage. 
Anytime we see that number seven, what does it remind us of? A complete spiritual number. And there's another seven shown here in the Grand Gallery, and that's it has seven corbels. This is a corbelled vault, so they step the stones in as they go up, and there are seven levels of those corbels. So yet another thing. And we, we think this helps us in understanding the symbolic numbers will help us in understanding the symbolic meaning of that passage as well. So we have two sevens here. It's seven times higher than the ascending uh, tunnel, and it also has seven corbels. Now, if we were to turn to the right and look at these handholds that you saw the, uh, the Brother Morton using, uh, we've kind of squared it off. Let me show you what is inset in the rock, which is most interesting, the shape of a cross. And you'll see that in our next uh, artist rendering from the top. So these go are associated with those handholds that you have to use to pull yourself up this steep passage. Now we're at the top of the Grand Gallery, and there is a great step. You go through a, a chamber where you have to bow down. There's a granite leaf, and they call that, that area the antechamber, so it's before the chamber. There's another area where you have to bow down, and then finally you come into the king's chamber. And please note, they're showing you in red the red granite part of the pyramid. Remember I said red granite was never, it was only used in temples. It was never used in burial chambers. And yet here, red granite is used in this portion of the pyramid. And so we, here we are looking from the top of the Grand Gallery, and we look at the transition from limestone to granite on the floor. So we're entering into the antechamber. If we turn around and look at it from the inside looking out, you can see much clearer the transition between the red granite and the limestone. So now we're in the antechamber looking back out. And you're looking at the backside of the uh, granite leaf. And so in the antechamber, you have a granite leaf. And this one's kind of interesting because what's the purpose of these leaves? Well, originally the purpose was those leaves were put in place to prevent entry into the, into the king's chamber. But you'll notice the first one, there's no grooves. You, it can't go down. So what's that for? And on the right, you're seeing the backside of that granite leaf. It's actually made of two slabs of granite that are joined together. So all of them were made of red granite. Three leaves moved, and one was fixed. And you had to bow down in order to get into this chamber. In the king's chamber, now we're looking back out where it says entrance. We're looking out towards the grand gallery. So we come in through the antechamber. There is a vent on each of the walls, the left wall and the right wall. You're only able to see the right wall. And then you see where the coffer is as well. And so all of these things are put in place. Now the vents in the king's chamber were always open. So there was always vents there. Remember, that's one of the characteristics we said. They didn't have ventilated tombs, except the Great Pyramid does. So here's a close-up looking at the air vent. And it gives you a real nice view of the uh, red granite. And this really shows that this was not a death chamber, but a chamber of life. Here is the coffer. And one of the impressive things about the coffer is the coffer is carved from a solid block of granite. It is about the same volume interior as the Ark of the Covenant. And there's no evidence that it had a lid. Uh, there's no mention of a lid anywhere. And the the uh, coffer had to be built in place. It was too large to go in place after the tomb was built. So it had to be part of the construction. It wouldn't fit through the passages. Next, we're going to look at the horizontal passage. Remember at the beginning of the Grand Gallery, it had a horizontal passage. It was very low. And then it entered into the Queen's Chamber. And so here again, we have one of the Morton brothers looking. You see, he would have to bend over to get in that chamber. He went six-sevenths of the way, and all of a sudden there was a step. And from that step on, he could stand up. And here is an entrance into the queen's chamber. On the left side, you see the niche. Now, you see a vent here. There are actually two vents in the queen's chamber. And the significant thing with the vents is they were closed. They were only found by sounding on the walls. 
They found a place that sounded hollow. They broke through and found that there were vents. And the queen's chamber is all limestone. It's not granite. Once again, there are corbels, and in this case, there are five corbels. Now, what is the importance and what's the significance of the niche? There is absolutely no reason to put a niche there. A corbeled vault is to distribute weight away from uh, the walls, and there's no reason to do that here. So it's got to be symbolic. And the thing that came to my mind is that Christ's kingdom, God's kingdom, is the fifth universal Empire. Keep that in mind as we continue. So we've kind of gone through the whole pyramid. We've taken the tour. Now let's look at some of the keys. And these are keys, I think, that uh, if you look at documentaries, they're not going to represent these things. We're going to look at the materials, the boss, the scored line, and the lamb's head. So these are things that you won't find in a National Geographic uh, commentary on the pyramid, but we think that they're incredibly important. And they are ignored by most commentators. The materials. The inner material, the blocks, are made of pneumolytic limestone, which is a, uh, it's a little bit of a pinkish-red limestone that has some uh, electro, electrical uh, conductivity properties. And it has small shells in it. The, uh, the casing stones were made of pure white limestone, a symbol of purity. And... The king's chamber was made of red granite, and granite we see as a sign of divinity. Number two, the boss on the granite leaf. Remember I said that granite leaf was made of two chunks of granite joined together, but the boss is carved out of that solid top piece. That leaf is immovable. So why? Why would you do that? It doesn't protect the tomb. It doesn't. What function does it serve? Well, if we look at the boss, what we will see is if we do a three-dimensional cross-section, it's five pyramid inches by five pyramid inches. And if you take five pyramid inches times five pyramid inches, that's what's called the sacred cubit, which we know is documented throughout uh, this period of history. In fact, it was a unit of measure, standard, and there's even a hieroglyph for it. So when you see this hieroglyph uh, with the arm to the elbow, that is for a pyramid cubit. And so we see represented here. So this gives us the scale of what a pyramid inch is. And this is very important. Because remember, we we use pyramid inches to do the measurements. So if we go 2,140 inches, pyramid inches down the uh, descending passage there, on each wall there is a scored line. And it's perpendicular to that passage. And what that helps us do is it helps us set the celestial alignments in 2140 B.C. And so if we look, the descending passage, that way of death, pointed to what? Alpha Draconis, the dragon. And if we look at the scored line, it points to the Pleiades, which is known as the throne of God. This would be on the equinox at midnight on 2140 B.C. And so the, these alignments are precise. And it's really amazing now we can... Uh, we can run these and find out with precision what they pointed to. One of the interesting characteristics of the Great Pyramid is it was not built on a level plane. The perimeter is level, but in the middle you'll notice it goes up. And what's the feature that's in the middle that it goes up for? Well, there's a grotto there. And what's that there for? So that is actually inside the stone part of the hill. Now, if you or I were to build this pyramid today, we would excavate it and make the base perfectly level. That's not what they did. That's a much more difficult way to build. And yet they did it. Why did they preserve that grotto? When we look at the grotto, here's a picture of inside the grotto. And so you're seeing a natural cave that they preserved. And let me put a lamb's head there. Now let me highlight for you the stone that the Bible students call the lamb's head. Do you see the significance, the shape of the head? That represents, we think, the lamb of God and the ransom. Remember, one of the characteristics that that God was going to use to reveal himself, this is one of them. It's pretty exciting. So we see that the pyramid gives us clues with with the uh, materials, the boss, the scored line, and the lamb's heads. So a whole bunch of stuff has been set up. 
This frames how we view the pyramid. Now, there's some amazing things with the pyramid, the accuracy of the layout and some of the measurements. My son was uh, wise enough to say, uh, Dad, when you give the talk, put the precision in there because that's a common denominator that everyone can say it's 99.998% accurate. And we can all understand that versus trying to translate the figures. We're going to go through it rather quickly. So north to south orientation within 99.99% accuracy. In fact, they said it's one of the most accurately true north buildings on earth. And that's kind of amazing for their day, isn't it? We look at some of the celestial signs, the uh, relationship of the pyramid to Orion's belt. We all know Orion's constellation, and in the middle there are three stars in a row. And if we look at those three stars and lay that constellation and line it up north to north, that looks kind of interesting, doesn't it? In fact, if we take it to the next step, we look at those stars superimposed on the pyramids, what do we see? Not only is the alignment and the distance proportional, but also the brightness is proportional to the size of the structures. So we have alignment, relative spacing, and relative size that match. And you can see it. Isn't that quite amazing? When we look at the south air shaft, from the king's chamber in 2140 B.C., it points to Orion, and it points to the star that would be associated with the Great Pyramid. Is that a coincidence? Well, we find that this is one of the constellations mentioned in Job 38 when God said, who's going to know this? God. And it points to the exact location in Orion's belt. Now for some of the mathematical proofs. We look in the base of the Great Pyramid is 365.242 pyramid cubits. Remember, that was 25 cubic uh, pyramid inches. And it's interesting because the Egyptian calendar had 365 days. It did not have partial days. And they didn't understand irrational numbers uh, like 365, 242. If we look at the calendar year, it has 365, 242, 185 days per year takes in that leap year and all that stuff. The Egyptians didn't have this knowledge, and yet it's represented in the size of the base of the pyramid. Are you interested? And that is 99.99995% accurate. Could you build a building today that represented it that accurately in a size? You would have a tough time. We see the pyramid uh, specifies the value of pi. And once again, they didn't have irrational numbers, so they didn't understand this. And so if you take the base twice, uh, divided by the height, you come up with 3.14159 And pi is, you'll see we've got five digits of precision to pi. And so it's 99.9998% accurate, represented. Uh, engineers call this an overdetermined structure. So there's things represented here that aren't really necessary for the design or structure of the building, but they're shown here. We're only going to show you a few. We look at the golden ratio. And the golden ratio is a, uh, it's used in architecture, it's used in design, and it's intrinsically a, a, uh, gives us our concept of beauty and symmetry as well. And so we take the apothem divided by the base, and it comes up with 1.618. That's the golden ratio. And... So when we have the golden ratio, you see we have one, then we go 1.618, and then it continues. It predicts that with 99.94% accuracy. The golden spiral. So if we look at this nautilus shell, and many seashells follow this, this is called fractal geometry. It's demonstrated in the shell. And it's also demonstrated here again. We have the layout of the pyramids, and guess what? It's shown there precisely as well. And it's also shown if you go through the capstone to the base plane, the basal plane, and then you come up to the great step, and then you go to the to the far side of the king's chamber, and then it will come out at the entrance to the king's chamber. That's the fraction. That's the loop precisely and mathematically. So we see a great internal symmetry in the Great Pyramid as well. 
we look at the golden ratio again, and people that have uh, facial features that, uh, that use the golden ratio are considered beautiful. It's universal. So when we see a, a picture of a beautiful person, it's likely that most of their features follow this golden ratio. If we look at the human hand, it demonstrates in our DNA the golden ratio. You see the proportion of the end of the finger to the, to the different bones in the finger. It demonstrates the golden ratio. It's in our DNA. And we look at buildings that are classic architecture, and they demonstrate the golden ratio. That's really when, when men became aware of it and started to design and use it. So back in the Egyptians' time, they didn't understand this principle. So this intrinsically defines beauty. Now, the difference between pi and the golden ratio is 0.5236. And it just so happens that there are 0.5326 meters to a cubit. And that defines the, that relationship with 99.8% accuracy. Is this a coincidence? The squaring of the circle principle that says that 2 times pi times the radius equals the circumference. And it works just like this. And this is basic geometry, so we can determine the circumference. Once again, the Egyptians did not have uh, these irrational numbers. They didn't understand this. But if we look at 2 times pi uh, times the height, it equals the perimeter. So we go height, and we look at that angle of the perimeter. It perfectly demonstrates. And this is the only size, relative height and width and angle they have to be precisely this to demonstrate what's demonstrated in the circle. We look at the, uh, the speed of light, 186,282 miles per second. If we look at this angle, 51, 51, 14, that's uh, 14 seconds, 51 minutes, 51 times 60, and then 51 degrees, 51 times 3,600, that's called arc seconds. Um, it comes up with 186,674 arc seconds. That specific angle represents the speed of light in miles per second with 99.8% accuracy. The uh, latitude also happens to show, so this is the position of the pyramid on Earth, also happens to represent it. It's at 29.9792458. Is that a coincidence? Yeah. Hmm. Pyramid uh, cubits, it's 10 million pyramid cubits to the, to the North Pole from the equator, and it's 10 million meters from the North Pole to the equator circumference-wise. Now, it's interesting because the meter was not even created until... 1798. So this is defining a relationship that didn't exist. Pretty amazing. When we lay the pyramid uh, down and we put its faces there, now if we lay the earth proportionally in that and we stand the pyramid height up, it exactly defines the, uh, the radius of the moon. So it shows the relationship between the moon and the earth with precision. Is that a coincidence? This is an overdetermined structure. We look at the Earth's wobble, and the Earth's wobble, we've all had a top, and when you'd spin it, it would, it would do a little wobble thing. The Earth actually has a wobble in it, and that cycle was not determined until the 20th century, so it wasn't even known in the pastor's day, and that's 25,772 years. So this is 20th century knowledge. Uh, today we're pointing at Polaris in uh, in 2140 BC, it was pointing at Alpha Draconis because of this wobble. If we take the uh, cross sections of the diagonals of the pyramid, it's 25,770 pyramid inches. That's 99.992% accurate. Is that a coincidence? We look at the location of the Great Pyramid with regards to the equator. And so we all realize that the Earth goes around the sun, and it's got a slight angle. That's called the ecliptic. And so we see 
actually, when we look at the Earth, the uh, pyramid is six and a half degrees above the ecliptic. Now, we look at the pyramid, and if we draw some conveniently placed lines through things like the center of the base of the king's chamber and through the uh, queen's chamber and from the center of the base of the, queen's, uh, the king's chamber through the top stone, we come up with these exact same angles. Now, let's take this, and, and so we see the pyramid there. Let's take this and just turn it on its side so we can demonstrate for you what we're saying. And so if we look at those angles, they exactly define the location of the Great Pyramid on Earth. Nobody had that knowledge when this was built. And it defines the pyramid's location within two hundredths of a degree. That's pretty amazing. In 2140 B.C., we know that it pointed at Alpha Draconis and the Pleiades. That ascending passage pointed at Columba, which was the constellation or the star known as Noah's Dove. If we look at the air passage, it pointed to Osiris, and Osiris was a constellation of rebirth. We look at the, uh, the pointers from the Queen's Chamber. One pointed to Mother Earth, Cyrus, and the other to uh, Ursa Minor. Remember, talked about the bears? That was one of them that was mentioned in Job 38. Cosmic regeneration. You starting to get the picture here? So these are the constellations that are defined for us when God said, who knows this? He's revealing himself to us. We look at some of the engineering, and there were some things that were a mystery. They had socket stones. They had sockets into the bedrock. And then each of the courses on the edge, there was a socket that fit in so that it was rigid. And so these locked in the corners. When we looked at the pyramid, uh, and this was not uh, discovered until there was uh, aerial balloons, at a certain time of day, they could actually see the lines on the pyramid down the center of the faces. So it's a little bit concave. The casing stones, however, did not have this characteristic. This strengthens the faces. We know this from engineering now. So we can run this through a computer design, and it's superior strengthening, and this is one of, I think, two pyramids that has this characteristic. We look at the irregular interior stones. So we're not seeing that smooth casing. This is the stones on the interior, and they, they seem kind of rough cut. And why would you possibly do that? Why would you do those features? Sockets on the edges, concave sides, loose interior stones, and a rigid exterior. And the best I can equate it to is if you've ever had a box of blocks and you put them all in there and they're not quite straight and you shake it up, this makes this, this building, we know today, it's thermally and earthquake proof. So this is one of the reasons that it hasn't been crumbling. Next we're going to look at the Book of the Dead. And this is the Book of the Master of the Hidden Places. And this was written by Egyptians about a structure that it's going to describe. It has a thing called the descent, the chamber of ordeal, the hall of truth and darkness, the well of life, the path of righteousness, bringing forth of the regenerative soul. All of these different passages, rather interesting. Secret place of the hidden God and chamber of the open tomb of resurrection. So this is an Egyptian book that describes all of these features. And when we look, remember we had these different passages, we can actually identify in this structure passages that line up with these descriptions in this book. If we put it in our context, we call the descending passage, which points to what? The dragon star, representing Satan, the descent, the broad road of destruction, the reign of death. We see the ransom demonstrated by the Lamb of God. We see the Jewish and the gospel age represented by those ascending passage and the horizontal passage representing the messianic age. Let's continue. We look at the subterranean passage, and when you get down there, you have to crawl on your knees. This is really a description of the way to the grave. We look at the passage into the king's chamber. You also have to bend over, and you're surrounded by red granite, and it's the way of righteousness. We look at the horizontal passage, and here's the point where you can stand fully up. It's the full measure of a man. 
And it's interesting because it's six-sevenths of the way down. And if we want to apply just a little bit of chronology here, 6,000 years of man's descent before he can stand upright and enter into a new relationship with God. So you have a full standing, showing the way of holiness. And so we see all of these demonstrated in the book of the dead, but then we replace it with what we call the Bible. And we see these features demonstrated very clearly for us. Also, if we turn the pyramid sideways, we can actually illustrate the chart of the ages within the pyramid. We see all of the different dimensions there lined up with the chart of the ages. Isn't that a beautiful picture? Who's going to understand these things? In due time, they would talk. God says, who is like me? Isaiah 46, 6 through 10. And thus the Lord says, who is like me? Let him proclaim it and declare it. Yes, let him recount it to me in order from the time that I established the ancient nation. And let them declare to them the things that are coming and the events that are going to take place. For I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me declaring the end from the beginning. And so God's challenging him and saying, who else can do this? Only God can do it. Who could represent the meter centuries before it was designed? Who could represent the mile before it was ever a measure? And so God records the future in the pyramid. Does the pyramid show these characteristics that we talked about? Time, geography, mathematics. These are all the things that Job 38 revealed, and God said, who can know this? Only God. God left his mark. And so who designed it? We feel it definitively. It was God. What is its purpose? Well, we understand that it has a cheap cornerstone. And it says that we're builded up together for habitation of God through the Spirit. And it's the stone that the builders rejected. And it is the perfect uh, template to build the entire rest of the pyramid. So with that one stone, you could build the entire rest of the structure. It's a model for the building. We look in the kingdom. This is exciting. In Genesis 15, 18, it says, The Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying unto him, Unto thy seed I have given this land. From where? From the river of Egypt to the river Euphrates. And what's on the river of Egypt? It's the great pyramid. To be a memorial between Israel and Egypt, the world of mankind, during the kingdom in the ages to come. Where else could it be? We think it's the Bible and stone. A memorial stone in Egypt to witness God's plan to mankind forever. That's exciting. We see God's plan demonstrated in it. What is its purpose? It's a witness for all eternity. Now I have a fourth question. And this one you have to discuss among yourselves. Was the pyramid a model of God's creation or was it the blueprint for his creation? We thank our Heavenly Father for from him and through him and to him are all things. To God be the glory forever. Amen.